Golden Radio Hour. Palmolive Brushless and Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Mary Astor. Friends of the Inner Sanctum, this is your host, Raymond, welcoming you through the squeaking door. Well, we're having a gay musical here tonight, featuring, of course, only haunting melodies. But I'm afraid none of the performers will get a hand unless it's a cold one. You see, it's so hard to applaud after rigor mortis has <laughs> set in. But uh, you can come in and... Uh, Set in, too. There are plenty of seats available. And if there's nothing left in the orchestra, we can give you a box. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum story, Melody of Death, is an original radio play by Robert Tallman and Robert Sloan and stars the famous movie actress Mary Astor in the role of Anne. It is directed by Hyman Brown. This Astro appears tonight through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Men, Inner Sanctum Mysteries ask you to shave with Palmolive Brushless and Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream. Either Palmolive Brushless or Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream gives you the cleanest, most comfortable shave you ever had, free from razor burn, or mail the cotton top to us and we'll refund your money. Have you a little gypsy in your home? One with a gold ring in his ear and a magic violin in his hand? Well, if he's anything like a fellow named Enrique, don't let him play an encore of the melody of death. Like a spidery web floating in midair, death hangs over the room where Anne is talking to her beloved David. Ghastly white, she summons the last ounce of ebbing strength to speak to him of love. Don't leave me alone here, David. I'm afraid. Just hold me in your arms. In a few minutes, it'll all be... David, what's that on your hand? Blood. How did you get... Oh, yes, I remember now. Cat. The cat with the yellow eyes. And the music. It was the music that started the whole thing, wasn't it, David? I remember now. That evening in Dubo's cafe. Henri, the gypsy violinist, came over to our table. Senorita is very happy this evening, no? You don't need your gypsy magic to tell you that, do you, Henri? The senorita is going to be married, no? You got it. Play for us, Henri. You know the tune I like so much. Los Infelices? Yes, that's the one. Oh, I'm sorry, senorita. I cannot play that melody for you. Not this evening. Why not? You will see it is foolish gypsy superstition, perhaps, but... In my tribe, it is believed that for a girl newly betrothed to hear this music is bad luck. Very bad. What kind of bad luck? Because if she hears this music at such a time, she will never stop hearing it. It will haunt her from, from that time forward. And her heart will follow the music. And she will do what the music bids her to do. Even kill her lover. If the music tells us to. Well, I'll take a chance on that, Henri. Very well, then. I will play, but I never say Henri did not warn you. Eh? Hey. What is it? That cat. Watching from the doorway. Look at its eyes. Yellow eyes. Darling, you're so strange this evening. Something wrong? 
Something's terribly wrong, David. The music and that cat watching from the doorway like... Like death. Alan. Take me out of here quickly, David. I'm afraid. Well, of course, darling. I'm sorry, David. I, I couldn't help myself. I felt I had to get out of there. I... You'd what, darling? And what's happened to you? Why do you look at me so strangely? I don't know. I keep thinking of what Alric said about that melody. It was bad luck for me. But I would never stop hearing it. It would haunt me and I would do its bidding. Even kill. And stop it. Get hold of yourself. I'm tired, I guess. You'd better take me. away from the cafe that evening. I was like a person in a hypnotic trance. I kept hearing that melody in my head. You will never stop hearing the music. It will haunt you. No. No, I won't listen to it. Even kill your lover if the music tells you to. No. I love David. He'll help me to forget. No one can help you now, Anne. Yellow eyes watching from the doorway. Like. Like death. I fought it. Fought it with all my strength, but it was no use. The music called me irresistibly back to that dingy little cafe. To Henrique. And to the cat with the yellow eyes. The cat that belonged to Lubos, a man I had never seen. He has come back. I knew you would. It was the music, wasn't it? The music told you to come. Uh, how, how did you know? You did not tell you it would be so. The other night, when you told the legend about that melody, something happened inside my head. And when you played it, it sounded so strange to me. And after that... You hear it all the time? Yes. I thought if I could hear the melody played again, maybe it would lift the spell. I'd do anything, anything to stop this thing that's torturing me. What do you know about torture? You hear music in your head. What do you know what it means to hate them until your, until your stomach turns inside out from hatred? And to work for that man and have him watch you every minute. And when he's not here, that cat of his, that devil of a black cat, watching me with those yellow eyes. Why do you hate Lubo so much? Why do you hear music in your head? Who can tell about these things? There are devils in both of us. I will help you kill your devil if you will help me kill Lubos. You're mad. You don't know what you're saying. He lives in a room now. The address is 117 Green Street. Take the cut with you and tell the druggist you want chloroform to get rid of the cut. Where is he? The janitor will let you in. Stop it. Stop it. I won't listen to any more of this. The music will tell you when it is time. The melody. Remember. No, no. I won't listen to it. I won't. I won't. But you are listening to it, aren't you? You can't help yourself. And you will do what the music tells you to do, won't you? No, no, I won't. What is the music telling you to do? To kill the bird. And you will do it, won't you? can I do for you? Uh, a bottle of chloroform, please. Well, yeah, that's a handsome cat you've got there, miss. It's a shame you're putting him out of the way. It, it has to be done. He has a stomach infection, quite incurable. Yeah, well, those things will happen. Here you are, miss. 
And that will be 38 cents plus tax. Put the chloroform in your purse now, Anna. Are you alone now? I'm looking for Senor Lubos. I've brought his cat home. I live next door to the cafe and... All right, all right. He's the first door at the top of the landing. Don't make no more noise on the stairs than you can help. You see, Em, how simple it is. That's right up the stairs. Wait now. Before you open the door, the bottle of chloroform. Get it ready. That's it. Now... Such a nice sound. Listen. Why do I like the sound? Because it reminds me of painful, scratchy razor burn. Men, when you torture your face with razor burn, don't just blame your razor blade. Instead, try Plumoly Brushless. That smooth, easy to spread, won't clog your razor shave cream. You see... Palm Olive Brushless is made with real olive oil to literally lubricate your skin so your razor just glides along with no tugging, no scratching, no scraping. Yes, mister, even the toughest beards lie down and wilt when you use Palm Olive Brushless. And your face is cool, comfortable, younger looking, not a bit drawn or dry. So why don't you quit bothering with a shaving brush and try Palm Olive Brushless? You buy Palmolive Brushless in the big money-saving victory jar, and we'll guarantee you the cleanest, most comfortable shave of your life. And we know you'll sing goodbye forever to painful razor burn. All right, friends, let's get back to that song that murders them. Remember how it goes? Remember how it haunted Anne into committing murder for Enrique? Well, it's still haunting her. And she's telling David about it in that room where death and this melody hover me. Yes, I was a murderer. I had plunged a knife into a man's throat and stood there watching while he died in agony. Then went calmly home. You were waiting outside my door, dear. Anne, where have you been? Oh. But Anne, your dress and your gloves. Why, David, it it looks like... It looks like blood, Anne. And it is blood. But I don't... Where did it come from? You mean you don't know? Oh, maybe it was on the seat of the taxi. Maybe somebody cut themselves in there before I... Maybe the driver had carried an accident case to the hospital. But why should you follow me into my flat in the middle of the night and cross-question me like this? What right have you? Maybe you've forgotten that this was our wedding day. I waited at City Hall until I was thrown out. Our wedding day? Oh, David. What happened, Anne? Well, I, I, I don't remember exactly. Don't remember? No, 
That tune has been running through my head. This morning it got suddenly worse. I was desperate about it. I thought maybe if I went back to Enrique and heard it played again, I might be able to get it out of my mind. Well, what happened? Yes? What is it, Anne? Music. That melody. Don't you hear it? I don't hear anything. Lubos was murdered a little while ago. A woman wearing a navy blue suit and white gloves went up to his room on the pretext of taking his cap to her. He tried to chloroform him, and failing that, she stabbed him in the throat with his own knife. No, no, I couldn't have done a thing like that, David. I... There it is again. Can't you hear it? And there's nothing to hear. It's just in your mind. I don't know what happened tonight, and I don't want to know. But one thing is certain. This man has you under a hypnotic spell. We've got to fight this thing somehow, this music you hear. Be quiet, David. Trying to tell me something. He's trying to trap you, Anne. He's going to make you remember that you killed Lubos. You'd better kill him too, Anne. Before it's too late. Oh, no. Not even for the music. Not even the music can make me do that, Henri. And what are you saying, Anne? Oh, it's all right. It's gone away now. It was trying to get me to kill you, David. And, darling, what has he done to you? David, it's, it's the music. Then why did you say Henrique just now when you were talking to to the music? I don't know. It's the music that talks. But it's always Henrique's voice. And... Did Henrique's voice tell you to kill Lubos? Yes. I remember now, David. Yes, even buying the chloroform. But I don't feel guilty. You aren't guilty. Now, look, do as I tell you, Anne. Take off these clothes and burn them. I'm going to lock you in here. If you hear the music again, fight it. Fight it with all your strength. I'll be back here in an hour. And when you see me come in that door, you'll know that that music of yours has been silent forever. Where are you going, David? To kill Henrique. So you have come to kill me because I've put hypnotic spells on your beloved. <laughs> Excuse me, what a joke, senor. It's no joke, Henri. A man was murdered a while ago by you. I thought it was proven that Lubos was murdered by a woman. Besides, I was playing my violin in the cafe at the time of the murder. While Anne, under your hypnotic spell, was doing your dirty work. Nonsense. He was stepped in the throat with a knife belonging to Manuela Rosales, a gypsy woman with whom he had quarreled. <laughs> Do not worry, my friend. I've, I've composed a new melody. Would you care to hear it, senor? Go ahead, Henrique. I'm listening. You must look at me while I play. Look at my eyes. It makes me play better. Well, what's the idea? What do you want me to do? Kill her. Kill your fiancé. Stop it. Stop it. Go. Uh, oh. I am under the spell of your music. All right. I'll choke the music out of your soul. Help me. I will. You. You are making a terrible mistake. Where is your your music now, Alric? No. No. Now that Alric is dead, we can go back to what we were before. We can be married. That's what you're trying to say to me, isn't it, David? Why not, Anne? Why not? Because. When you opened the door and came back into this room a few moments ago, music was still playing. Not playing now, is it, Anne? Is it? No, not now. Oh, David, take me in your arms, darling. Tell me it's all right. Tell me again so I'll really believe it. Oh, Anne. It was just a bad dream, wasn't it, David? They never really existed, did they? 
Ulrich and Lubos and the cat with the yellow eyes. Of course not, darling. Of course it was just a dream. <laughs> David! It's all right, darling. I see it too with the black cat. Oh. You followed me home. Uh, you see, it's really quite friendly. Go ahead, darling. Tell you. All right, David. There, that's it. You see, it's just an ordinary cat. Yes. Yes, of course. Take the letter opener, darling. The letter opener on the desk. Go and get it. Yes, of course. And you're not hearing it again, are you? Anne! Is that the music again? Oh, no, David. It's just that I've been crying so much. I think I'd better fix my makeup. Be a darling and bring my purse, will you? It's in the bedroom in the top drawer of the bureau. Oh, sure. I'm back in a second. Now, Anne. Now take the letter opener and follow him. That's it. Quietly now. He mustn't hear you coming. His back is turned. He's still rummaging in the bureau drawer. <laughs> the poor fool. Quietly. Quietly. Now, and now. Hey, put that knife away. No, David, it's no use. I can't find it any longer. I must kill you. And so ah! Oh. Oh, David. David. And darling, speak to me. I didn't mean to do it. I tried to grab your arm. That's all. The point of the letter open it turned oh, and... It's all right. I'll give a doctor. Oh, no, David. Please don't leave me. It's better this way. If I lived, I'd, I'd have to kill you. The music would make me do it. There might be others. Yes, David. It's better this way. Oh, Anne. Anne. It was the music, David. The music. A melody more beautiful than life itself. Listen to it, David. Melody of death. of melodies, I want that little number for our concert we're giving in the lower chamber of Music Society of Inner Sanctum. As a matter of fact, I want Enrique to fiddle around, and I want... Oh, see, si, Senor Shaving Cream, what is it you want? I want lots of lather. I want lots of lather. Okay, you men who use a brush when you shave, you want lots of lather. And you'll get lots of lather simply by using palm olive lather shaving cream. For an honest whisker wilter, millions of men say there's nothing like it. In fact, more men use palm olive lather than any other kind. Here's why. First, palm olive lather shaving cream gives lots and lots of lather. He-man lather with millions of moist bubbles to blitz your beard. Second, palm olive lather is made with olive oil and oil from the coconut palm. To lubricate your razor, speed your shave, smooth your skin. So, if you're a lather and brush user and want to get rid of razor burn, get Palm Olive Lather for the smoothest, easiest shave you ever whistle your way through. Get Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream, knowing it's going to leave your face looking younger, your skin smoother, your disposition better, or your money back. <laughs> Friends, what would you do if you found out that someone you knew was peddling stolen merchandise? You'd be horrified. But uh, tell me something. Have you ever bought extra gasoline coupons or accepted them from friends? Have you ever bought gasoline without giving up coupons? Ah, well, you know what I'm thinking. That makes you a receiver of stolen merchandise, and that is a serious offense. Yes, friends, every precious drop of gasoline we can spare is needed for our armed forces. People who buy gasoline without surrendering their own coupons are getting more than their fair share of the fixed civilian supply. So play square with gasoline rationing. Use only the coupons issued to you legally. 
Oh, friends, by the way, the latest Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Moon Was Red by Dana Sage. Oh, now look here. Here's a calling card and a confirmed appointment for next week's Inner Sanctum mystery. That dapper demon of deviltry right from Hollywood, Adolf Manjou, to suavely and smoothly scare us right over, out of our uh, <laughs> Inner Sanctum. And now it's time to close the squeaking door until next Saturday, when palm olive brushless and palm olive lather shaving creams bring you another inner sanctum mystery. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. What is the 14-day palm olive plan? Yes, what is the 14-day palm olive plan? It's the biggest beauty news in years. Doctors tested this plan, proved it brought lovelier complexions to two out of three of all the women tested. Here it is. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Then massage for a full 60 seconds with palm olive beautifying lather. Then rinse. Do this three times a day. Easy to do, yet 36 doctors prove this palm olive plan brings a lovelier complexion to two out of three women. No matter what type of skin you have, dry or oily, the 14-day palm olive plan works. So get palm olive. See what palm olive can do for your skin in only 14 days. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Palm Olive Brushless and Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Mary Astor. Welcome, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, Raymond, inviting you to come in through the squeaking door and catch your breath. Now, don't be embarrassed. Many of my guests here are out of breath, but uh, they won't tell on you. I assure you, they won't breathe a word of it. You see, they were warm, too, when they came in, but they've cooled off now. You see, I've kept them on ice. Now, if some of them seem a bit unfriendly to you. Don't mind. They can't help being stiff. <laughs> Tonight's inner sanctum story, The Silent Hands, is an original radio drama by Robert Sloan and Robert Tallman and stars Mary Astor in the role of Nina Kohler. Miss Astor is soon to appear in one of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's 20-year anniversary pictures, Meet Me in St. Louis. Tonight's Inner Sanctum drama is directed by Hyman Brown. Men, Inner Sanctum Mysteries ask you to shave with palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream. Either palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream gives you a clean, comfortable shave every time, free from razor burn, or mail the cotton top to us and we'll refund your money. When a murderer sneaks up behind you and you're having to rear view mirror handy, the best thing to do is listen carefully and try to hear the sound of the silent hand. High up on the bluff, overlooking a west coast harbor, police cars feel their way through the fog on their night patrol. They're on the lookout for a mysterious woman in white who has already strangled three men and pushed their bodies over the cliff. Attention, all police cars. Attention, all police cars. Woman in white evening dress reported walking with middle-aged man in Overlook Park. Investigate right away. Investigate right away. Michael. Yes, Nina. It's getting chilly. Oh. Finish your cigarette, will you? Let's go in. Of course, Nina. Yeah. 
Take my coat in the meantime. Put it over your shoulders. Thank you. What? You're trembling. What's the matter? Nothing. Just nerve, that's all. Michael. What, dear? My bag. It's gone. Well, are you sure you had it with you? Oh, yes. Positive. Oh, well, it must be around here somewhere. Go on ahead, Nina. I'll find it for you. No, I... Oh, all right. But be careful of the cliff. Now, don't you worry, dear. Go on ahead. I'll catch up with you in a moment. Don't be long, Michael. Don't be long. I won't. Always losing a bag. I'm always finding it for her. Uh, hmm. There it is. Is it? Oh! Let go of me. Let go of my neck. Don't you ever go home, Barnes? Not when there's a story to get out. Huh? I'll be finished in a minute, McGraw, and then we can leave. Okay. Oh. Hello, Barnes speaking. Mr. Barnes. Yeah? You want a good story for your paper. Get into a cab and drive to Overlook Park right away. The fourth victim of the woman in white has been found. What? Tell me that again, please. I didn't catch the address. Quick, McGraw. Get on another phone and trace this call. I'll what? stall as long as I can. Okay, okay. Did you say that was Overlook Park, madam? Hello? Hello? Never mind, McGraw. She rang off. Well, who was it? Some dame trying to give me a tip on a murder. She said the woman in white had taken care of another victim. The woman in white? Yeah. We'd better get over to Overlook Park right away. There may be a story. I do. Well, wait a minute, Frank. What's the matter? Are you scared? Well, well, sure I am. You don't know who that was. It might be a trap. Come on. Hey, look, don't be a fool, Barnes. You might be the next victim. you got to call a cop. And tip off every other newspaper in town. Come on, McGraw. Every second counts. <laughs> Holy mackerel. That dame was right. Look down there on the rock. What is it? A man's body. A man without a coat. I, uh, we, we better get the police. Yeah, we'll phone the story in and then we'll... Hey, wait a minute. Huh. Look at this. Barnes, uh, don't, don't touch anything. I will I just want to see if... Yeah. The same, all right. What's the same? This metal ring on the ground and a piece of silk next to it. That's what they found before in every one of these murders. What do you suppose it means? I don't know. Cops say it's like an East Indian trick, practiced by highway thieves. A precious stone or coins left on the road. When a traveler stoops over to pick it up, wham! A silk noose has slipped over the neck, and in a few seconds, it's all over. Fine. Yeah? Somebody watching him. What? Over there, behind that head. Something moving. Something white. You got a gun? No. Neither have I. Come on, we better not fool around. Which way we go? Back to the car? No. There's a house beyond those trees. Maybe we can get to a phone. Okay, let's run for it. Right. What the devil's that? Sounds like some kind of a tropical bird. You mean here in the park? This isn't the park. Yes, oh, yes. Yes, that tropical bird you hear is in the aviary next to the house. It's part of my private collection. You live in that house? Yes, with my sister. These are our grounds, gentlemen, and your trespassing. Well, lady... Uh, well, we're looking for a telephone, madam. We're from the Chronicle, then. I don't care where you're from. You'll have to leave immediately. But someone's been killed. You'll have to leave immediately. My sister is ill. She can't have any excitement. Nina! Nina! Go back into the house, Carolyn. Nina! I've been looking for you. Where have you been? You know very well I've been out here feeding the birds. Why do you ask? Because I didn't see you. I thought perhaps you went back to the place. Carolyn, you catch cold out here. We'd better go back in the house. But who are these men, Nina? 
Reporters, dear. We'd like to use your telephone, miss, if there's one in the house. Why, of course. Come along. I'll, I'll take you to it. Thank you. If you men are reporters, I suppose you want to phone your paper about... About what? Nina, you heard it. I'm I... sorry, dear, if I held your arm too tightly. I didn't want you to stump You're me. lying. You don't want me to talk. That's not true, Carolyn. You can say anything you please. Go ahead. Say anything you please. Oh, oh. oh Nina. Please forgive me. I, I didn't mean what I said before. I... I'm just upset because you've left me alone so much tonight. But I haven't left you alone, dear. Oh. I've been in the house with you all evening. Don't you remember? Oh, yes, of course. You've been with me all evening. In the house. I think you're strong enough now to take these gentlemen inside and show them to the phone. I'm going to stay out here for a while and uh, speak to the birds. Yes, Nina. This way, please. Now, go along, McGraw. I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, I'll put the call through. <laughs> Are you staying behind just to watch me? In a way, yes. You're a fool. Well, maybe I am. But these birds you've collected fascinate me. Especially the gaily colored ones which were brought over from the Orient. Oh, are you a fancier? In a manner of speaking. At least I know that the creature with the yellow bill and the green eyes is a very rare species. I had to write a story about it once. Indeed? Yeah. It's found only in certain parts of India. What if it is? You've been to India, haven't you? Never. You're lying. I'm not accustomed to being spoken to like this. But you are accustomed to lying. Only that alibi about not being out of the house tonight won't stand up. Won't it? No. That dress you're wearing is torn. And the piece that's missing from it is in my pocket. I found it out there on the cliff, near a metal ring and a bit of silk. Now you're lying. I have the evidence right here in my hand. Give it to me. Not so fast. Let go of my hand. Let go. Open it. Open it. I'll dig my nails into you. Wait a minute. Wait. I'll open it. There. I knew you were lying. There's nothing in it. Oh, of course not. But I found out what I wanted to know. For a woman, your hands are abnormally strong. So now it's your turn to watch me and follow me around, huh, Mr. McGraw? Oh, not necessarily. Your friend must think I intend to run off before the police arrive. But he's wrong. I have nothing to fear from the police. Of course not. Don't stand there and grin at me. I'm cold and miserable. If you had any manners, you'd take off your coat and offer it to me before I freeze to death. You can have my coat. Hey, thank you. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the house. There's a police car there now. Well, good. I'll go back with you. Just a moment. What's the matter? My watch. I've, I've lost my watch somewhere along the track. <laughs> Who are you kidding? I just saw you throw it over in the grass. Here it is. I don't hear it. What's the bill? Where'd she go to? Where'd she go to? I stopped. No. 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 Just put me up. a nice boy. But, you know, it's his own fault in a way. He never should have tried that jump without a parachute. He may hurt himself someday, like the fellow who, when shaving, gives himself a good case of razor burn. Men, when you torture your face with razor burn, don't just blame your razor blade. Instead, try Palmolive Brushless, that smooth, easy-to-spread, won't-clog-your-razor shave cream. You see, Palmolive Brushless literally lubricates your skin, so your razor just glides along without tugging, scratching, or scraping. Yes, mister, even the toughest beards lie down and wilt when you use Palmolive Brushless. 
And your face is cool, comfortable, not drawn or dry. So why don't you quit bothering with a shaving brush and try Pomali Brushless? You buy Pomali Brushless in the big money-saving victory jar, and we'll guarantee you a clean, comfortable shave every time. And we know you'll sing goodbye forever to painful razor burn. Let's get back to Nina on that beautiful Indian rope trick. After that uh, double-header killing, Nina was picked up by the police and put in jail on suspicion of murder. But the case against her was still pretty slim, and... Uh, when Barnes went down to his cell to get a story for his paper. You seem very confident for a woman who has so little time left to live. You're meddling, Mr. Barnes. Something that doesn't concern you. No, it does concern me. McGraw was a good friend of mine. I'm warning you not to interfere, Mr. Barnes. You'll regret it if you do. You'll regret it more. I have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Nothing but your life. Yeah, what about yours? Ah, uh-huh, they'll never convict me. Don't be so sure. I'm innocent. They can't even keep me here another 24 hours. So your lawyers are going to spring you, huh? I have influential friends, Mr. Barnes. And when I'm free, I want to be left alone. You understand? You don't frighten me, Miss Cola. I'll get the goods on you if it's the last thing I ever do. If you try, it will be the last thing you ever do. Oh, thank you. Nina, you're free. You're free, darling. Yes, I know. George told me he was getting out of writ. You see, Mr. Barnes, I have influential people. Well, they won't always be able to help you. No? Come along, Carolyn. I have so much to tell you. Yes, dear. Mr. Barnes, you've got to help me. What? It's a matter of life and death. Come to the house tonight at 10 o'clock. I'll be feeding the birds in the aviary. Right. Carolyn! What are you doing? I'm coming, Nina. I'm coming. Miss Kohler. Miss Kohler. Oh, Mr. Barnes, thank heaven you're here. I was afraid you wouldn't come. Well, you said it was a matter of life and death. It is. It is. My sister's been lying to the police, and she's made me lie for her, too. What do you mean? Well, that night you were here, that night Michael was killed... She told you she was in the house with me all evening, but she wasn't. She was out with him, walking through the park. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't, I couldn't. I was afraid of what she might do to me. You don't know her, Mr. Bond. She'd kill me if she thought I was telling you this. But I've got to tell somebody. I, I've just got to. Wait a minute, kid. Get hold of yourself. Uh, the night this fellow Michael was killed, your sister made you say that she was home with you all evening. Yes, that's right. Did she tell you why she wanted you to lie for her? Yes. I don't believe her. She said she had nothing to do with Michael's death, but that there was no way of proving her innocence. She was afraid that police might convict her on circumstantial evidence if I didn't give her an alibi. I see. Uh, one more question, Miss Gola. You've been to India, haven't you? Yes, we lived there a number of years. I thought so. When I saw that bird with the yellow bill and the green... Well, by the way, where is that bird? I don't see it. It's gone. The cage is empty. Your sister must have taken it away. I had to, oh, Mr. Huh? Barnes. He was dead. Oh, Nina. Why are you I... so frightened, Carolyn? Have you been talking out of school? No, no. What have you told him? Nothing. Nothing. I haven't said a word. You're lying. I... Go into the house, Carolyn. Just a moment. Are you meddling again, Mr. Barnes? I'm more than meddling. I'm going to protect the state's key witness in its case against you. So you have told him. Yes. Yes, I told him everything. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care. I don't Be care. quiet. Be quiet. I don't care. How long do you think you can keep this up, Miss Caller? Aren't five cold-blooded murders enough for you? You're a fool, Barnes. Phone the police, Carolyn. Hurry. I'll keep her here until they arrive. Carolyn, don't you dare. Phone the police, I tell you. She'll kill you if you don't. Yes. Yes, I'll call them. Right Carolyn, right. come back here. The jig's just about up, Miss Caller. You think you're clever, don't you? Not especially. But I know who committed those murders. You don't. You're wrong, Mr. Barnes. I can prove that you're wrong. You're wasting your breath. But I'm innocent, I tell you. And I can prove it if you give me half a chance. What chance did you give McGraw? I wasn't anywhere near McGraw when he was killed. And Michael was my best friend. Yeah, tell that to the cop. 
Give me a break, Mr. Barnes. I'll admit I was with Michael that night he was killed, but I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it. You couldn't have done it? No. I'll show you why if you let me go back to the place where it happened. Uh, what do you think I am? I think you're a gentleman, Mr. Barnes. And I know you want to find out who murdered your friend. But you never will find out if they convict me. You'll never find the real murderer. Won't you believe me? Won't you give me this one last chance? Uh, I don't know. Please, please, let me, let me prove that you're wrong. Okay. Where do you want to go? Back to the edge of the cliff. Michael and I were standing just about here, Mr. Bond. Yes, go on. We were talking about the mysterious murders that had taken place on these bluffs overlooking the harbor. We were joking about the fact that I was a woman dressed in white. You're in white again tonight, Miss Cola. Yes, it's my favorite color. I see. We stood here for a while, and then the cold air chilled me, so I asked uh, Michael for his coat. Uh, may I have your coat, please, Mr. Barnes? What's the idea? I want to show you what happened. Well, do you have to be that graphic? Yes, it's important. The details are terribly important. All right, you can have my coat. But I'm warning you, Miss Cola. I know the game. Flipping a silk loose over a man's neck is done more easily when his coat's off. That's why all the victims were found in their shirt sleeves. But Michael was the only one I knew. I couldn't possibly have had a motive for killing the others. They're complete strangers to me. That's not much of a defense. Psychopathic murderers often kill without a motive. They do it for the thrill it gives them. Whether they know they're victims or not. All right, continue with your story, Miss Cola. Well, after I put on Michael's coat, I started toward the house. Eh? Yeah. And then I missed my bag. Eh? Yeah. I guess I left it near the edge in this, over there somewhere beside that rock. <gasps> Good heavens. What's the matter? Isn't that another bag over there? Where? Beside the rock. Get it, Mr. Barnes, and bring it here. What? Bring it here. Oh, no, you bring it here. <laughs> oh, all right. If you're that frightened of me, I will. Just an ordinary bag. I don't know why you were afraid of picking it up. Nothing could have... Oh, my neck! I knew you couldn't resist another victim, Mr. Barnes. But you forgot about my strong hands and this coat I borrowed from you. You should have known better than to try that trick while I still had it on. There are other ways of committing murder, Miss Kohler. And I'm sure a psychopathic killer like yourself knows most of them. Yes, I do. Stay where you are. Uh, uh. Uh, you're, you're smarter than I thought, Miss Kohler. I never dreamed that you'd find a gun in that bag. That was the chief's idea. You underrated our police force, Barnes. We've suspected you for some time. We couldn't get the goods on you till tonight. We? Yes. Didn't you know there were women detectives? I... My sister and I have been leading you on ever since you killed Michael. And all the time I was figuring I could pin the rap. On you. Uh. Oh. That Barnes boy gave me the willies. And that, of course, leads to the gimmies. Well, look here. Here's... Laptop with the wanties. I want lots of lather. I want lots of lather. Okay, you men who use a brush when you shave, you want lots of lather. And you'll get lots of lather simply by using Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream. For an honest whisker wilter, millions of men prefer it. In fact, more men use Palmolive than any other lather shaving cream. Here's why. First, Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream gives lots and lots of lather. 
E-Man Lather with millions of moist bubbles to blitz your beard. Second, Palm Olive Lather lubricates your razor, speeds your shave, and leaves your skin smooth, cool, comfortable. So, if you're a lather and brush user and want to avoid razor burn, get Palm Olive Lather for a smooth, easy shave that you'll whistle your way through. Get Palm Olive Lather shaving cream knowing it's going to leave your skin smooth, your face clean and comfortable, or your money back. Well, it's time to fold up the ghosts now, those little folds, and put them back in the closet with the family skeleton, which is something... But remember, the next time you're out in the park on a foggy night, keep your shirt on. And keep your coat on, too. A little silent hand that I'll have to give you a pain in the neck. Uh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery is Set the Spider to the Fly by Richard Shatter. Well, if there's no more business to scare up, I guess I'll turn on the darkness. Thanks. So, until next week, when palm olive brushless and palm olive leather shaving creams bring you another inner sanctum mystery. Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> What is the 14-day palm olive plan? Yes, what is the 14-day palm olive plan? It's the biggest beauty news in years. Doctors tested this plan, proved it brought lovelier complexions to two out of three of all the women tested. Here it is. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Then massage for a full 60 seconds with palm olive's lovely soft lather. Then rinse. Do this three times a day. Easy to do, yet... 36 doctors prove this palm olive plan brings a lovelier complexion to two out of three women. No matter what type of skin you have, dry or oily, the 14-day palm olive plan works. So get palm olive. See what palm olive can do for your skin in only 14 days. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Mystery Playhouse. A rebroadcast for the service men and women of the United Nations. Good evening. This is Peter Lorre. <laughs> Would it bore you to hear a tale of tragic murder? Are you unwilling to sit through the telling of a strange and horrible story? The brief narrative of a man caught in a web of evil? You're not? <laughs> then, my friends, keep right on listening to the Mystery Playhouse. <laughs> Humor, I've heard it said many times, is of real benefit to him who possesses one. This particular sense has come to be so generally admired that it has attained the stature of a first-class virtue. Well, the fellow whom you're about to meet while, while hardly falling into the virtuous category, he does have a sense of humor. <laughs> Things like murder or hate and madness, or, or someone telling him his mother just died, <laughs> practically rolls him in the aisles. He loves a good, ghoulish joke. Oh, and he loves to tell them, too. He's about to start one now. So follow me, please, to the inner sanctum and your host, Raymond. <laughs> Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. 
Now, come in, won't you? This is your host, Raymond, again, disturbing the peace. Say, have you ever, ever had the screaming meanies? Did you ever get an attack of the yelling and wailing jitters? You walk in your sleep? Did you ever wake in the middle of the night shrieking at the top of your lungs? Oh, you do? Well, you must be an awfully hard person to live with. Well, friends, it's time for our story to begin. From this point on, forget everything pleasant. Get a finger ready to chew on, turn the lights down low, and listen to Peter Lorre tell you the blood-curdling tale, Death is a Joker. Come with me to the criminal court building. A tense hush falls upon the spectators as Charles Luther takes the stand. Gentlemen of the jury, I'm accused of murder. I'm an actor, a comedian. Look at my face. Ugly, huh? Yes, so ugly that whoever looks at it laughs. I'm not telling you this to win sympathy for myself. I, I tell you this because it is important to your understanding. The strange events that brought me to this courtroom today to plead for my life. Shortly before midnight of November 28th, I went to the apartment of my friend Robert Langwell, the famous actor in Matthew Yard. Charles, well, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink? No, don't bother. I don't want anything. No? Well, here, may I take your thing? Mm. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, George. Yes, I have the money for you. You'll be up? When? 20 minutes? Yes. Bye. George Galvin. You know him, Charles? Yes. Rotten actor. An excellent poker player. So I've heard. Mm. Robert. Robert, before leaving the theater tonight, someone told me that you and Julie Winthrop are going to be married. Is it true? Yes, we'll be married in two weeks, right after my wife gets a decree in Reno. You must not marry Julie. Not marry Julie? Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I know Julie well, and I, I also know you. That's why you must not marry her. Charles, it might be better for you to mind your own business. Julie and I are in love with each other. No, you are not. She's fascinated by your good looks. She, she's impressed by your fame, but she, she does not love you. Now, look here. We may be old friends, but I've stood all I'm going to. I... Oh, wait a moment. Hmm. I get it now. You're in love with her yourself. I? I in love with Julie? No, we, we are just friends. Friends? <laughs> You're madly in love with her. That's why you came here tonight, isn't it? No. <laughs> Friend. Stop your laughing. You, in love with a girl like Julie. Why should my love make you laugh? Oh, so you admit it, huh? All right, I do. Why is it so funny? Do you think she'd have you? You, a, a clown, ugly, clumsy. <laughs> you, in love with Julie? <laughs> then why not? Why not? You! Stop your laughing. Stop it. Can I? Look at yourself. Charles, let go of me. No. You're choking. Let go. A joke, huh? Charles. A joke. Laugh. Go ahead. Laugh now. Laugh. Robert. Robert. I didn't mean it. Robert! Good Lord, what have I done? I rushed out of his apartment, trembling. I turned my coat color up to hide my face. The streets were crowded with people coming from the late movies and restaurants. I tried to make myself act naturally. But it was impossible. Everyone I saw, every pale of eyes that looked at me seemed to accuse me of my crime. I stopped, waited for the light to change. Paper, mister. Morning paper. Read about the Reynolds execution. 
Here, let me have one. There you are. I, I didn't know Reynolds was to be executed tonight. Yeah, they burned him. Well, he deserved it. Murdering his friend like he did. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You forgot your chain. Oh, never mind, never mind. I went to my apartment and I looked at the newspaper I'd bought. There was a photograph of Reynolds on the first page. In his face, I saw my future. The shattered hopes, the torch of the trial, the horrible, nerve-wracking experience of waiting for death. I flung the paper away. I went to the window. I opened it. I looked down 17 stores to the ground. Huh. How tiny people look. The automobile lights moved like so many fireflies. I climbed out on the edge. I braced my arms. I took a deep breath. One last look. I closed my eyes and... Those are my... I hesitated a moment. I decided to answer it. I closed the window, went to the door. Hello, Charles. Julie. Why did you rush away from the theater tonight? I was anxious to talk to you. Talk to me about, about what? Uh, I need your advice, Charles. What's wrong? Well, it's Robert. What happened? Well, nothing happened. It, it's just that I'm not sure I love him. I'm not sure. Yes, when I'm with him, everything seems all right. He's mm. handsome and charming, but when I'm alone, I begin to wonder and to doubt. Why? Can't you guess why? Yes. You, you left someone else? Yes. Well, who is it? You. Me? Yes, that's what I came here to tell you. That's why I don't want to marry him. Mm. Yes, I would have told you before, but I was so afraid of making a fool of myself. Mm. You didn't seem to care. I didn't care. Julie, this is crazy. I, I loved you from the moment I saw you. You loved me? Yes. But, darling, why didn't you tell me? I tell you? How could I? You, you're too young. So, you're so beautiful. And I look at me. Ugly, clumsy. How could I speak to you? Oh, you both were. How you locked me into nothing to me. Nothing? Of course not, darling. How lucky we are we found out in time. In time? <laughs> in time? Oh, merciful heavens. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Charles, what's wrong? Oh, what what a, a joke. tears streaming down your face. <laughs> Charles, you're hysterical. Now stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Julie. Something you must know. Yes, sir. Tonight I committed a murder. Murder? What are you talking about? I killed Robert. Killed Robert? Oh, out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. But is it true? I went to his apartment and we quarreled and I killed him. Oh, no. You told me a moment ago that you loved me. Do you still love me? Yes, Charles. And, and tell me what to do, Julie. Help me. I, I, I can't think. I, I don't know where to turn, but... What can I do, Julie? What can I do? <laughs> Pull yourself together, Charles. This may not be as hopeless as you think. Why? Was Robert alone in the apartment when you called? Yes. Were you seen entering or leaving? No. Are you sure? Yes, his apartment is on the second floor. I, I walked up and down. What time did you get there? Shortly before midnight. And what did you do before that? Went to a movie. Movie? How long did you stay there? Oh, only about 20 minutes. Do you have the ticket stub? Huh? Yes, here it is. Oh, do you realize what this means? That, 
They may never find out about you. Never find out? That's right. They won't suspect you since they can't know your motive. No one saw you enter or leave, and you have an excellent alibi. Motive? Alibi, Julie, do you realize what we are doing? We are talking of this as, as if we planned this crime as, as though we were criminals. But I committed a crime, yes, but I'm no criminal. I, I didn't mean to do it. I know, darling, I know. You must think of your own life now. Oh, and mine. Yeah. Yes, Julia. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm not a criminal, but I must play the role of a criminal now. A subtle, clever criminal who is cunning enough to escape punishment. Can I do it? Can I do it, Julie? Charles, listen to me. We must find out how much the police know. If it's hopeless and they have found out about you, then it would be best to give yourself up. But let's not make any decisions until we know. But how can we know? Did Robert expect anyone tonight? Yes, George Galvin phone probably was there. He said he'd be up in about 20 minutes. Then the body must have been discovered by now. Yes, I'm, I'm sure the police must be there by this time. I think that I'll go to Robert's apartment. No, Julie, no, no. I, I don't want you to become involved. I'm already involved. Well, for me, this horrible thing would never have happened. The least I can do is to help you now. But Julie... Promise, promise me you'll not leave this apartment, Charles. All right. I won't be long. Julie. Yes. If something happens, if, if something goes wrong and is separated before you return, I, I want you to know that I don't know what to say, Julie. You don't have to say it, darling. I know what you mean. Goodbye. Goodbye. A criminal. I have to think like one, to act like one. Have to be one. What question would be asked? Where were you at 12 o'clock midnight of November 28th? Uh, I was in a movie. I'm busy. She is the sub. No, no. No, they, they can see immediately that I'm lying. My voice must not tremble. I, I shouldn't be so quick with the answer. Where were you at 12 midnight of November 28th? Where was I? Let me see. Well, I... I left the theater and I went to a movie. It was a very amusing picture. <laughs> very amusing. Can you prove what you say? Prove? Well, I don't know. I, I, it would be difficult. I, well, I may have to take it to somewhere. Yes, here. <laughs> Let me show it to you. Here it is. Did you ever quarrel with Robert Langwell? Quarrel with... We were friends. We played in many shows together. We were on the best of terms. That's all, Mr. Luther. You may leave now. Yes. I can plead. It is possible. I can escape punishment. Police. Can it be the police? Or maybe it is Julie. Good evening, Charles. George Gill. I know it's rather late for an unexpected visit. Yes, it is. But this is important, Charles. A matter of uh, life and death, you might say. What do you mean? Have you a cigarette? Huh? Yes, here. Thanks. Well, what's the matter, Charles? Your hand's trembling. <laughs> it's nothing. You don't seem to be your usual self this evening. No quips, no jokes. What's wrong? I don't always feel like joking. Yes, Charles, it's strange about human nature, isn't it? Who would have ever dreamed that tonight, a few minutes before midnight, you entered Robert Langwell's apartment, quarreled with him over Julie, and choked him to death? What are you talking about? Uh, you're an excellent actor, Charles. But you're wasting your talents on me. Save them for the footlights. Or the police. Police? Will you please tell me what all this is about? Still acting, huh? Now, look, Charles. You killed Robert shortly before midnight tonight. You are mistaken. I was in a movie at that time. Oh, so that's your alibi. Very clever. Now, Charles, either we discuss terms now or I go to the police. Wait. How did you find out? That is my secret. What do you want? Money. All you have on hand. All you can dig up. All right. Come with me. I I have some money in the bedroom. All right. Uh, just a moment. What is the business? 
Uh, Why? I'm taking no chances. Let's go. All right. Well? Where's the money? Charles, stand back or I'll fire. Stand back. No! Let go of my hand. Let go. I'll twist it. I'll I'll twist it till the gun points to your head. Charles, let go of my hand. You don't know what you're doing. Come on, come on. Fire now. The bullet will enter your brain. Fire. Charles. Fire. Charles, don't. I'll make you fire. I'll squeeze your fingers. Charles, let go. Go on. This is all a joke. I'll make you. Stop it, Charles. Um... Uh... Just a second. Just a second. Charles. Darling. Darling, there's nothing more to worry about. Everything's all right now. We can be married and go on living and never fear anything. What makes you say that? Darling, you didn't commit a crime at all. What do you mean? Robert's alive. Alive? Yes, he's downstairs now paying the taxi. Robert? He's alive? Yes. I spoke to him about the marriage and he was wonderful about the whole thing. Darling, aren't you happy? Her worries are all over. You can smile and be gay. That must be Robert now. Hello, Charles. Robert. I thought you were... Well, I'm not. But, but how did you... You see, I fainted. George Galvin came in and brought me to. George Galvin. Did you tell George Galvin what happened? Yes, I did. Look here, Charles. As I told Julie, I'm willing to forget the whole thing if you are. Forget? Forget? Yeah. It might have ended tragically, you know, but... Thinking it over, I realize I'm as much to blame as you are. So if you're willing to shake hands. Shake hands. Dear, now, darling, there's nothing more to worry about. I feel so happy I could... Charles, what's the matter with you? It's... It's nothing. (laughs) It's nothing. (laughs) It's nothing. (laughs) Ha, ha! Gentlemen of the jury, I became a criminal all well, because I thought I had committed a crime and I had to think like a criminal. <laughs> My motives were those of all men. I wanted happiness and wanted marriage to the woman I loved. What would you have done in my place? And I still think I know that guy. I wish I could place him. Well, it must be wonderful to have a sense of humor, but I don't think Charlie feels much like laughing. Do you? We'll pay a return visit to the inner sanctum and its fun-loving host, Raymond, soon, but don't go, please. Not until we drop in at the green room, where the players are rehearsing our next performance in a mystery playhouse. Come with me, please. Come, come. Change the dressings at midnight, and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie. Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear? I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. 
Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see you again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Dent. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold. You'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... you promise not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us... To yes, me. Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But, but hurry back. I, I want you near me. I will, dear. So good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Was it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. Your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. Horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation? Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But 
You think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but this is different. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. The patient is a Hindu or a Persian named Chandra. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two, but his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. Doesn't the doctor sound familiar to you? Huh? <laughs> That's right. It's Boris Karloff, up to his old tricks. I think it might amuse you to be on hand for our next performance, when we present Mr. Karloff and Creeps by Night. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.